In the game of football, context is everything. When you're deciding if it was a good decision or a poor one, or you're trying to sort out the elite from the good or the good from the bad, context is the main factor. It's the one thing that separates your understanding of how a game really went. For some players, like Carson Wentz on the Colts, context is critical. To end the year, the Colts were on a three-game winning streak and were sitting at 9-6. and six. They then played their final two games against the Raiders and the Jaguars. If they won either, they likely would have made the playoffs. However, they lost both and consequently went home. In this video, I want to look at the final two games for Carson Wentz. Was he to blame for their struggles or were there other factors involved and Wentz is actually being unfairly criticized for what happened? Before we do that though, if you can do me a huge favor and like and subscribe to my channel, I would greatly appreciate it. So anyways, to start this video, I want to look at one of my favorite plays made by Carson Wentz. This happened in the first quarter against the Jaguars. He made a really good throw. Wentz connected with T.Y. Hilton for a 33-yard strike over the middle of the field. After two field rushes by Jonathan Taylor, Wentz was forced into a 3rd and 7 situation. Before the snap, the Colts were in shotgun. The Jaguars showed a single high safety look while the Colts were in a 3 verts concept. The safety started to rotate to either side of the field. They were actually playing cover 2 rush 5. In this defense, the safety split the field while the underneath defenders are playing zone match coverage on the receivers. With every receiver running vertical route, this pushed them all backwards. I want you to pay close attention to Wentz's eyes on this play. He's staring down the left sideline receiver. Since the Jaguars showed a single high safety look before the snap, his initial read was to look at the sideline for one of these matchups. He apparently liked the left side the best, but he realized during his drop back that the Jaguars' field size safety was sitting at the hash. This told him that something was off. The defense was in a split safety look. Wentz then moved on to his next read, which is T.Y. Hilton on the seam route, where he was attacking the space between the safeties. Wentz threw this perfectly. He placed it in only a spot where Hilton could bring it in. He threw it over the trailing underneath defender, and Hilton was able to bring it in for the 33-yard gain. Outside of this throw in the first quarter, Wentz's performance wasn't very good. It wasn't all bad, but it certainly wasn't good enough. Take this example in the third quarter. This was a god-awful interception, and I still have no idea what he's thinking. Before the snap, the Colts ran a play-action fake handoff to the wide receiver on a jet sweep in the backfield. The Colts then ran a flood concept attacking the Jaguars' defense. The Jaguars are playing with a single high safety look and are running cover through here. A flood concept is actually a good play call against his defense. Given that it's first and 10, this is a good idea in order to vertically stretch the sideline zone defenders of the Jacks' defense. Ideally, what should have happened is that the jet sweep action in the backfield should help hold the hook curl linebacker while the Titans' out route should sit in the vacant zone. However, Damian Wilson didn't fall for this ruse. He read the play perfectly and he carried his own correctly to the sideline. This is literally textbook defensive coverage. Instead of seeing this though, Wentz just yelled YOLO and he threw it anyways. Wentz should have dumped the ball to the running back in the flat. That's where the ball should have gone and that would have been a positive play. I think one of my main takeaways from watching this game was how bad the Colts offensive line played during this one. Look, I'm not making excuses for Wentz, he played poorly in this game. What I am going to point out though is that he was under pressure on 42% of his snaps. The average was 34% last season, while the best quarterbacks in the NFL like Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers, and Justin Herbert were only under pressure less than 28% of the time. Brady, in fact, was only under pressure on 21% of his passes. So in this one game against the Jaguars, Wentz was under pressure roughly double Brady's season's average. Now you as a quarterback can definitely cause your own pressures. That's not lost on me. Wentz was definitely guilty of doing this during this game, and I'll point out an example shortly. However, not all these pressures can be blamed on Wentz. In fact, pretty much every single offensive lineman for the Colts was beaten multiple times. Three different offensive linemen allowed sacks, Eric Fisher, Quentin Nelson, Brandon Smith. While Ryan Kelly and Mark Lewinsky didn't allow any sacks, they each allowed three and four pressures respectively. Needless to say, the Jaguars' pass rush had a really good game. Josh Allen had two sacks off the edge, while Roy Roberts and Harris created seven pressures from the inside. When your offensive line gets beat like this consistently, it's hard for any quarterback. Again, this isn't excusing Wentz's play. I'm just pointing out the fact that every QB, including the Tom Brady's and the Patrick Mahomes of the world, do play worse under pressure, especially when they're under pressure over 40% of the time. Let's look at an example where Wentz literally can do anything. The Colts ran play action. Their goal was to stretch the sideline zone defenders with a post and out route on the left side. If they weren't open, then 14 would have been the option underneath. As you can see on this play, there really wasn't anything Wentz could do. You have a blitzing linebacker that hit the hole perfectly, and Wentz was taken down here. You can't blame him for the sack. You can, however, blame Wentz for this sack on this one. It's first and 10, and the Jaguars have a single high safety deep. After the snap, they were playing cover three. For the life of me, I still don't get why Carson Wentz started by looking left. Versus a single high safety look, you are picking the side that gives you the best chance of success. You want a numbers advantage. The left side is a two on two play, while the right side is a three on two matchup. The left side is often called a levels concept. Levels can be a great play against a two high safety look. It's not great against single high safeties. Wentz should have started right, and he could have had the opportunity for two throws on this one. 
the seam route by the slot receiver was open, while the check down underneath was wide open too. Again, this is first and 10. Worst case, you take the check down and you get five yards. Maybe he breaks the tackle and gets more, but regardless, this was a poor decision by Wentz. He started the play incorrectly and it resulted in a sack. During this game, Wentz was sacked six times. I had him responsible for three of those sacks. What's interesting is that the Colts also lost to the Raiders in the previous week. As I said earlier, if they won either of these two games, they likely would have made the playoffs. Against the Raiders, Wentz was under pressure on 52% of his passes. Think about that for a minute. That's every other snap. That's ridiculous. How does an offense function when every single player keeps getting beat left and right? Now, so far in this video, we've covered some bad from Wentz and some horrible offensive line play by the Colts. Another thing I noticed was that the play calling by the Colts offense was extremely conservative in both of these games. It was like the Colts were trying to protect a lead that they never had. There were way too many run-run pass sequences during these two matchups. They even happened after Jonathan Taylor would only get one or two yards on first down. Now, I do get that Taylor is an incredible running back. It's just at a certain point, your offense becomes predictable, and that's what happened here. The conservative play calling consistently put Wentz into horrible situations. There was way too many third and long play calls during these two games. For example, we have this play that happened in the middle of the second quarter against the Raiders. On first and second down, the Colts called two running plays. This gave Wentz a third and nine. Then to make matters worse, the Colts are called for an illegal formation penalty, which pushed them back another five yards. This means Wentz faced a third and 14. The odds of converting on a third and 14 are very slim. Last I checked, it was below 20%. With that in mind, the Colts almost converted this one. The Raiders were playing cover three and they placed their underneath zones right at the sticks in order to prevent a first down throw. Wentz did a great job of working his eyes backside to the blaze out run by Zach Pascal. Wentz had time in the pocket, he was able to fully angle his body for the throw. However, since his feet were already spread apart from a pump fake a moment ago, he has to make this throw all with his arm. Wentz has no consistency with his motion. He constantly overthrew receivers. That's what happened here. He simply can not control his placement with this motion. He put the ball too high on this 20 yard throw and the Colts were forced to punt. Plays like this last one were extremely frustrating to watch. First, you have a poor situation set up by overly conservative play calling. Then you have a penalty and obviously Wentz's missed throw definitely hurt. Now, once again, I'm not saying that the conservative play calls that put Wentz in this situation were the cause of this inaccurate pass. Oh no, that pass is 100% on him. What I am saying is that the longer the throw, the more likely the quarterback will miss. When it comes to Wentz, this is a huge deal. He's never been the most accurate passer, so these things do add up. I'll be honest, I thought his game against the Jaguars was bad, but it wasn't bad compared to this game against the Raiders. His game against the Raiders was a whole lot worse in my opinion. People will say he had a 60% completion percentage and he didn't throw an ugly interception. While true, his only touchdown was on a fluke bounce that should have been picked off and he missed throws left and right. The only thing consistent about his game against the Raiders was how poor his accuracy was. He left so many yards on the field. For example, you have a delayed wheel route up the sideline. This is a busted coverage that should have been a monster play. This easily would have been a 30 yard pass to T.Y. Hilton, but Wentz simply missed it. Again, there's no excuse for this throw. Now, before we end this video, I wanted to talk about his trade to Washington and give you a summary of my thoughts on the situation. If you listen to me on the All Galdi podcast or have been following me on Twitter, you'll know that I wasn't a fan of this trade. Washington gave up two third round picks and based on playing time, the one in 2023 could turn into a second rounder. All Wentz has to do is play 70% of his snaps. Unless something happens throughout the year, this will likely be the case. On top of that, Washington is on the hook for his full contract and they didn't negotiate it downwards. His cap hits amount to $81 million over the next three years. Now granted, none of his 2023 or 2024 cap hits are guaranteed, so they can definitely cut him with no cap repercussions. But the $28 million cap hit this offseason had a big impact on the free agents the commanders could bring in. I just don't believe Wentz is worth $28 million and the draft picks they give up. Now, I view what I just said as kind of the bare case to my thesis basically the downside of the trade. On the positive side, Carson Wentz is objectively better than Taylor Heineke. He will in fact improve this team. Using the analytics approach, Heineke was as replaceable as you get. His wins above replacement or war was as close to zero as possible. Potentially, it was slightly negative. Meanwhile, a quarterback like Wentz is more in the 0.5 to 1.5 range in terms of wins created. This alone is a positive. Washington just gained a full win on average by trading for Wentz. But even with that in mind, it's okay to criticize the process of this trade. It was a move made out of desperation and Washington capped their upside by doing this. Will Washington make the playoffs with Carson Wentz in their current roster? It honestly wouldn't shock me if they ended up as a wild card this year. The question isn't if they can make the playoffs. The question is if Wentz can create enough wins to push them over the top and make this team an actual contender. For me, I'm on the record saying that answer is no. However, I'll gladly admit I'm wrong if Wentz does the impossible in Washington. Well, that's all I have for you in this video. I really hope you enjoyed it. I'm going to take a week off as I have some travel plans coming up and I'll see you guys in the middle of June.
In the meantime, I'm always open to suggestions, so if you do have ideas, please let me know. As always, if you want to support me directly via my Patreon account, use the links below, and you can follow me on Twitter at Samuel R. Gold.